Do they change? So do your questions change from episode to episode or is it always the same? It's always the same list of questions. Um, okay. But I change up the questions every couple of episodes. Like I'll cool. switch out, like maybe I'll change the order or I'll change a question or two. There's questions that have been here since the very beginning, but I like the format of having a set of questions that everyone answers. I love that. That's a great way to do like, there's a there's this film producer named Brian Grazer. And he's done everything that you, everything that you love. He's probably had his fingerprints on. <laughs> and he has this concept of curiosity conversations where every week he has a curiosity conversation with somebody uh, where he sits for an hour and talks to them about what they do. And it could be, you know, he interviewed the, I mean, he's interviewed everybody. Like he has so much clout that he can talk to anybody. So, but he'll also talk to people that are just like his gardener or something. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's just the, truly the curiosity of the life of people. And I'm like, Oh, I've always wanted to do that. But I think going into it with a qu list of questions that are, fun and kind of rapid fire make it kind of a really fun game like it feels like a nice way to get into it instead of just kind of interviewing somebody yeah smart. well okay <laughs> you say rapid fire take as much time as you want for any of these <laughs> i say that okay. intentionally um sure. what was this guy's name again i'm gonna write it down because i've never heard of him brian grazer i'll send all the stuff y'all if you see me kind of looking at my computer um it's just me uh, writing notes of things we're talking about. Question one is really yeah. simple, straightforward. Who are you? <laughs> oh no, you think that simple test? That is the meanest thing you could ever do. Who are you? You know, I just watched, I don't know if you've seen this um, Hulu show, or it's a special kind of called In and of Itself. And it's a, um, it's like a magic special, but it's really about identity. And I watched it like yesterday and it's, it will wreck you if you watch it you will become emotional it is it is very interesting and i think it's such a, an interesting question of like who are you um i'm gonna answer it just basically i guess i i'm nina i live in la i'm from south america but i grew up in the bay area and i spend most of my time writing directing acting doing comedy in various ways whether it's sketch or improv stand up more recently which has been really fun but I just do a bunch of things. And then hobby wise, I love games. I love to play like chess or go surfing or be outside in nature. Like we were talking about before. I just like to spend my time being outside in any way. What are the three things you value most in life? Oh God, these are, I should have like, I don't meditate. Oh, um, okay. The three things I value most in life are um, spontaneity without a doubt i think spontaneity and nobility like just something new happening i think things are very planned these days and we schedule ourselves into holes and we really don't allow for life to kind of get in there so when things just happen or if i had a friend walk up my driveway and was like hi what what are you doing you know i'd be like well i can't hang out right now but like if it was a different moment uh if they were just like let's go, go on a walk i just think that kind of organic living is we don't do that anymore. You know, it's it's very it's a very over the plate answer, but it's very yeah, it's very important to me. So uh, spontaneity, I think loyalty is something I really value. Like consistency, people being really like, I well loyalty. I I feel like for maybe forgiveness. Like some, I think forgiveness is something I really uh, value because we're like I don't. We're also in an era where there's a lot of shifting and changing that's happening that's really important but we're also getting into a space where we don't really uh allow the room for people to grow or understand or we're also expected to know everything because we have the internet and i think there is a lacking of the gray area so that's another thing i value and then i really value <laughs> um i like want to do like a more fun answer i'm like all i can think about is ginger tea like that is <laughs> that's like another thing that i'm like I really value, I drink it like three times a day. It keeps me very, I don't know. Like I'm like thinking of that Vogue question where they're like, what are the essentials or the things you can't live without? And that is just, I think one of the things I can't live without. I'm going to eat myself alive later when I remember something more poetic or important, but for whatever reason, ginger tea is just like, you got to mention me, you, <laughs> Yogi ginger tea. Like you have to bring me up in this conversation. So 
yeah, I don't know why. What about you? What are your three? So just, just to say, most people do that where I think it's just the LA comedy training where it's like, okay, two good things. And then the, the rule of three has to, be, have to say something. <laughs> so it's usually like food or like, you know, Christmas or like, you know. Yeah, th- yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, for me, yeah. So this was the very first question I ever came up with for this show. Great um, question. And I, the reason why is because I kind of went through a period of like, well, who the fuck am I? And what, what, what do I want out of this whole thing? And yeah. not this whole thing being this show, this whole thing being existence. The video game of life, yeah. Yeah, I, I think this answer has changed so much. But right now for me, it is, um, I want to learn. Yes, I want yes. to be kind. Like kindness is, um, curiosity and kindness. Those are my like two big things. But also, if I pick a third, it is connection. Those yes. are the three. Like, because they all come into what I do. Every, yeah. 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 Like, everything I do in my life, if I can be kind to someone, if I can help someone, if I can say just something that will make the brighter. Like, today, for example, I was on a mad one today. I don't know what was up with me. I went for a walk, and I was like, I came across a lady with a dog. I was like, your dog is super cool. And then later on, I came across a guy with a Rick and Morty t-shirt. And I was like, your t-shirt's fucking cool. And I was like, ah, living in some sort of anime protagonist world. <laughs> and, um, but you know what? Uh, it, for me, it was just a day where I was able to appreciate things. And so all of those things combined, curiosity, kindness, and connection. Those would be my three. I think those are great because they also overlap into different things where like, I think with connection, I think of food where I'm like, oh, when you have a dinner with somebody and that like feeling of connection, or if it's you feel connected to playing a game like Last of Us and you, you know, see yourself in it or you see a theme of something you're going through, like connection is a, is a really big one learning too, but maybe that overlaps into forgiveness. I think like, that's the point is like, just yeah learning while we're here because there's so much to un- try to understand and no one knows what they're doing so I, I'm, I'm with you on all of those those are great great answers question three is tell me a memory that shaped you oh man i mean i don't know why but well the first memory that comes up i'll probably just do that because it's coming up but um and i have a horrid memory but i when i was about eight years old was at a soccer practice and and it was a really hot day and i had a girl on my team her name was gabby um, and we were in line doing a drill yeah i must have been eight i must have been eight and out of nowhere out of nowhere she projectile vomits next to me just like like really unnerving and it wrecked me for years like years and years and years um i had this chronic phobia where i couldn't sleep I couldn't go to like school. I developed this like crazy sixth sense where I can like, since you, I was on a plane yet two days ago, flying back from New York and in front of me, I could tell that the person in front of me was getting motion sickness and I just like shut down. But what's crazy. And it's actually uh, the timing on this memory coming up is interesting because I had for like 10 years, this chronic phobia and every winter for me flu season was a pandemic it felt like a a pandemic and i would like not go out and it's affected things like when i would do scenes in college for improv in chicago in the winter i would only breathe through my nose so i was a slower player but in the summer i didn't care so i would like talk more on stage and um and then also when i was eight eleven eight to eleven my dad had cancer and so he would get sick and so i think there's just this massive dna kind of weaving going on where it just rippled and had a crazy butterfly effect around my life but the crazy thing is in the last couple of years it's been okay like i i like went to therapy for it and like it's been something because when you have anxiety as a person you get nauseous so for me when i have anxiety and i get nauseous it gets perpetuated like the the fear gets perpetuated and i start to snowball into this like uh really panicked state so i spent the last four years really regrounding and learning about meditation and how to be balanced i don't take medications i don't do anything like that not that it's bad but i was like i need to get a grip on this on my own and um the craziest thing is in the last couple years like i don't really think about it that much but um 
the pandemic happened and I, it did not scare me at all. At, like this whole time I've been like, can we go? And obviously I stayed inside and I, we all do our part, but like it, it didn't scare me at all. And it still doesn't where I'm like, for some reason, I feel like I've been in training for the last like 10 years and the day I arrived and I'm like, oh, so now you guys don't want to share drinks. And now you guys like want to put up like protectors when it was my idea. I was crazy. Um, but yeah, I think that that's a, just a really big moment in my life that like rippled all the way until today where it, it has informed a lot of decisions I make. It informs like, yeah, I don't know, but it's weird with the pandemic because I'm really not scared of it at all. And I should be horrified, but I'm, I'm not at all. Question five is tell me in as much detail as you can about something you knew of which once existed and now does not. Okay. I'll play your game, Tess. Um, what an insane question. I love it, it is, but, it's, but it, what a great prompt because it took me back somewhere really I haven't gone to in a long time. When I was, well, we are just, ch I don't really have phobias. Like truly throwing up in the dentist are like my big phobias. And, the dentist just because I hate the sound of metal on teeth. Um, but I would go and every time I'd go to the dentist, it was like a cartoonishly rainy day where I would wake up. My mom would be like, it's time to go. And I'd be like, okay. And I am very prone to having cavities. There's just something about the divots in my teeth. I brush and floss. I take very good care of my teeth, but regardless, I'm kind of just in a rough position and I get cavities. And it always upset my mom. And I never wanted to upset my mom because my mom is somebody who gets upset because of disrespect. And so she gets very quiet. And me not doing my part in brushing my teeth and her having to pay for my cavities, she goes really quiet and it's really scary. So I would really, really dread going to the dentist. But if I went to the dentist and it went well, we get to go to Target. And if we went to Target, then I would go into the toys aisle and I became obsessed with kind of fascinated by these things called tech deck dudes and a tech deck dude like tech decks i'm sure you know right like the little finger skateboards but these tech deck dudes were these little toys and they had different personalities right it's almost it was kind of like avatar building before club penguin or you know sims where you could collect them they have different personalities, different jobs, things like that. This is my version of Barbie. And what they were were thumbs. Like they were just thumbs wearing clothes on skateboards with like magnets on their feet. And I, for like ages, was obsessed with them and tried to collect as many as possible. And uh, now that you've asked this question, the floodgates have opened. And I'm like, oh my God, all these things that I've forgotten about. But those were like, they made me feel high. Like buying them I or going and getting them made me feel high because I was like I don't have cavities which is like already I'm like in the clear and I feel like the serotonin cranking through my system and then we go to Target and I like remember how to get to that aisle I remember the smell and the feeling and tearing open the box and taking them out and kind of rolling them and how quickly they'd roll across the tables and what was cool is they were magnets so I could put them in random places in my house and it became this game that my mom and I would play where we would move them. And now we do it with a little tiny Spider-Man, like just a Spider-Man figurine, where when I go home, I'll find it and then put it somewhere else. And it's just kind of like a constant, like kind of like a group chat, but it's just Spider-Man moving in different parts of the house. Um, so that's something, I mean, I haven't thought about that in years. And I don't really know like the history of, of Tech Deck Dudes, but that's just something that doesn't exist anymore that I feel like a lot of people don't know or maybe they remember and, and I just didn't have friends who, who played with them but I think they all had like bios and stories which I think is why I like them because you you kind of had a character story they kind of give you the the tools you needed to play with them where I didn't have to come up with all the answers of like this is Jake and Jake is a pharmacist and he likes to skateboard on the weekends they'd give you kind of the story if I'm remembering correctly I might be misremembering question six what if anything is perfect I'm like Jennifer Lawrence. <laughs> um, let me think, let me think. What if anything is perfect? I honestly have a weird obsession or not even obsession, but like appreciation for fruit. 
like I think fruit is I think nature is perfect I think nature is harmony damn there are a lot of things I think when people sing in harmony that's perfection or very divine um because it can be different but I think nature as a whole is is perfect and we kind of interrupt its perfection but it always returns to perfection so even if we get in our own way and we go extinct it will be because of us not because of nature nature will always rebalance so I'm always just really in awe of nature and I I just like I'm looking I have a lemon tree outside my window and the fact that they every time I eat a piece of fruit and you see how perfectly or imperfectly constructed it is it's it shows up to do its job if you're on time right and just when I peel I had a tangerine before this and you peel it and you're like this is a perfect snack that is made by the planet entirely every molecule splitting atom whatever was made into this beautiful beautiful piece of fruit <laughs> is as close to perfection as anything i've seen before i mean there are so many things that you could say are perfect like i could look at tv and i can go oh i think pen 15 is a perfect tv show that's an opinion but i really do think it's hard to look at something like an apple or an orange um, or a grapefruit like a perfectly ripe grapefruit mango and deny that there's any level of like creative creator perfection going on so yeah fruit okay i'm trying to just do what first comes to my mind because i'm like these are fun questions and i'm like oh yeah fruit is perfect who is your favorite character from fiction of any kind and why i'm really on a villanelle kick right now from killing eve i actually had a conversation with somebody about this yesterday i i really do love jennifer lawrence and seeing her in silver Lining's playbook back in i think 2012 or 2014 she played kind of an unhinged woman or not even unhinged it's unfair for me to say that she was just being an expressive woman making interesting choices and so any character that falls within that i gravitate towards very heavily i think it's why fleabag is really successful and it is an interesting character i think uh that's why i like shows like pen 15 you have these really complicated women who are going through puberty um but i would say my favorite character or the person like I would want to like play would be Villanelle from Killing Eve right now that I mean that can totally change but who, I really who, who do love this character I've never I've never heard of them I know oh them. oh you gotta I honestly suggest just hopping on YouTube at some point and looking at Villanelle's best moments and just watching so villain so Killing Eve is about this M M15 I mean MI5 um secret agent in london and she starts to believe that there's a serial killer and everybody thinks it's a guy serial killer but she sandra oh being the, the main character thinks it's a woman and so she kind of goes on the case on her own to try to find out who this person is and it's this beautiful woman but she's horrible she's horrible she's a psychopath sociopath you know uh social what is it social personality dis disorder um antisocial personality disorder she has something right and she just is a fucking killer but not in a james bond way in a very apathetic very funny very ironic winking at the mortality of the world kind of way she has incredible outfits gets to play a bunch of different characters you know uses different languages and accents like she is kind of a swiss army knife of a person and she's incredibly interesting to watch and jodie comer who plays villanelle is just a brilliant actor from liverpool and i mean she's everywhere now so noting that she's from liverpool isn't that cool but she if you if you watch interviews with her she's the sweetest girl like has the liverpool accent and it's just so kind and then you watch her play this absolute savage and i think it's a testament to the character obviously her acting as well but I'm just, I'm really happy to see a show where a woman can just be bad. And it's not about necessarily redeeming her. She has redeeming qualities. She's very likable, but she's bad. And I kind of really, in this moment in my life, I don't know what that says about what I'm going through, really love these shows that just allow women to be bad and mean and terrible without any third act kind of sticking the landing of like but then she becomes a mom and makes the perfect pie like i could not care less 
I want to watch her like go to the Italian countryside, slam back a bunch of caprese or like caprese sandwiches, and then just murder an entire family. It's very, very cathartic. Yes, I do. I also understand evil in a sexy way. That's why I love Villanelle too, because she she's incredibly hot, like insanely hot, but also isn't like Charlize Theron hot, where you'd be kind of assuming oh, this tall, beautiful blonde is going to come kick in the doors and kill all the boys. She's a little bit more unique. And there's something about that, too, where I'm just like, wow, this person, like, they're such, they have such character. And she has bravado, too, an incredible amount of bravado. And because she's a sociopath, she kind of plays victim and can pull people in because she's so cute. And then just, like, absolutely. I have to stuck. watch this fucking show now. Oh, the first season is phenomenal. Beyond the first season, I don't want to be discouraging, but it's not great. But the first season is so fun. Like, at least watch the pilot. The pilot is a wonderful piece of TV. Is is the first season standalone? No, it's it's uh, like the second season isn't it isn't a new story or anything. It's a uh, okay. It's but, continuous. Yeah, could I watch the first season and be like, okay, I could leave it there. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, I like doing that as well. I'm currently watching all of TNG, like Star Trek: The Next Generation. Oh yeah, so, yeah. Um, I'm gonna add it to my. I basically I'm binging TV shows. So I went. I'm binging Castle, which is a cop show. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, like I mean, obviously A Cab, but I grew up watching cop shows, and it's Nathan Fillion. The man can do anything, and I love him. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, now I'm on to TNG, and I'll probably watch that next. So. Yeah, you'd have fun. You'd definitely have fun. Uh, question eight. What fascinates you? Behaviors. People, emotions, and how people react to things, without a doubt. I think that's why I like filmmaking and I like comedy, is kind of constantly bringing new material forward to see how people will react. I think what's interesting is that there isn't... We have a baseline set of emotions and kind of an etiquette for certain things but everybody goes through different moments and experiences in their life from minute one and it informs your emotional capacities and reactions and what you find appropriate and inappropriate so for me i think the most interesting thing and i think the most honestly the most interesting part of being alive is just being able to see how people react to things and i'll do things on purpose to kind of watch people react i'm not crazy or anything but i'm going through a phase right now where i re- <laughs> I want to start little rumors about my friends just to see how long <laughs> it takes to get back to me. But also, but they're not bad. It'd be like, oh, Tess. Um, I, if we had a friend in common or I was talking to Riley or something, I'd be like, oh my God, yeah. Um, and uh, Tess got a dog. Isn't that cool? <laughs> just, so when you two, just so when you two meet up again, you have to work through like, why would Nina do that? Why would Nina <laughs> say that? I didn't get a dog. And I would just, I mean, ideally in a perfect world, be hiding in my lemon tree, like watching you guys <laughs> try to sort this out in an organic way. Um, yeah, and I'm just fascinated by kind of social media and in that world and how we kind of, how we're, how do I, like the performance of reaction and the performance of behaviors, certain behaviors. And I'm really just endlessly entertained by people reacting to things. You should. You should do that. You should tell people that oh. I have a dog. Please do. Mm-hmm. I No, I've, I've told this to many of my friends where I'm like, hey, guys, I'll probably start rumors about you soon. And <laughs> if it gets back to you, it will probably get back to you and they will tell you that I told you. Let me know, one, how long it takes, and two, what happens and how you guys work through it. <laughs> it's just fun. I think it's just fun. Like, I love little chaos. Like, everybody's very careful now and they're very connected and everyone has all this information that I'm like, what information can I, like, pepper in to again to to question one with values kind of interject some serendipity and um a break in the kind of monotony of our performance of being a person so question nine is what piece of media should everyone consume again what's gonna kill me is i'm gonna give you an answer and then later today i'm going to remember my answer and and remember something else and it's gonna kill me i mean god there's so many things i mean I really, one of my favorite stand-up specials is Bo Burnham's Make Happy. And I think it's a beautiful, I mean, he's this, he is honestly 
the one per it, the if somebody had like the dinner dinner party question where it's like if you could sit down and talk to anybody i think he would be my answer um make happy is just an incredible like meditation on self at this point in history and in comedy and, and i connect to it because of like i we do very similar things um and that one i just like really i personally connect to but then there's like there's a movie called wild tales it's phenomenal from argentina that every time i send it to somebody and they watch it they're like how does nobody know about this movie um but i honestly one piece of media right now the first thing that came to mind and maybe because of where i'm at emotionally right now this song just it's always been one of my favorite songs of all time i think it's a perfect song and the the lyrics are just really hitting for me right now and and whenever i kind of feel stressed out about time or where i'm at or you know, who i am i listen to this song it's like so white girl of me but like john mayer has a song called stop this train and i think that song just recently has been really 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 but my whole life like my whole life i've had this song my conscious life i've had the song and it never gets old it comes on it makes me feel elated or sad or happy it's just a very melancholy kind of look at time passing and, and how badly he wants to stop the proverbial train to stop and his conversation with his dad about what it means to have time pass and it's just i don't know maybe with covid too it's hitting a little harder with time passing and kind of making peace with that but i think maybe right now might that would be my answer is is that song if you could name a hot sauce what would you call it <laughs> i would call it <laughs> I call it Zuzazu hot sauce. Why? I don't know. It's like very much in my vernacular just to use zoo as a filler for anything. And I'm like, <laughs> Zuzazu. Also, like, that is the emotion I probably feel when I eat hot sauce, which is just like, Zuh! like, you just feel the, like, for me, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be like, it wouldn't be like, uh, colon obliterator or like some whatever. It would be like, a word like it would it would be like a fake made up thing i don't know if i would be clever enough to come up with like a clever kick-ass hot sauce name it would be like a nonsense word question 11 is what's your most prized physical possession it would probably be something like related to my dad like some sweatshirt i have that's his or an, a record or like i have a guitar over there i don't know if you can see it now you can't um, that's his, and I and I value that because of its value. But I I don't know if I'd want that to be my answer. I think like I was probably, I really love my car. I like grew up loving cars, and it in LA becomes kind of like a moving living room. And growing up, I always just felt really I I'm very cold all the time, and my mom is a reptile, so we like never had the heat on. But when we would go in the car, it would be warm and that like hot leather. I always just felt really safe in cars. And I grew up, I learned to drive when I was like eight. And there's a, there's a level of feeling of control because when you have a parent die so young, you feel like you don't have any control. So I think I had this obsession with, I had go-karts and dirt bikes and all these different vehicles before I could drive legally. And then once I drove legally, it was kind of felt like my space for the first time that i owned and nobody else could have I, i'd say maybe my most prized physical possession would be my apartment because it, it feels like my home but if something happened to my apartment like I, my car just i love it because i love driving i love the the safety of, of being in a car i love the i love my actual car the type of car like i bought a nice car because i like the way it moves and i appreciate the the craftsmanship around it and um yeah just when i leave a party or i leave a, a hang or you know being with people i really find a lot of solace and peace being in my car um it's a very la thing it's one thing when i was in london i love public transportation it makes life much easier to move around but i ached like physically ached to have my car back and so once i got back all i did was just drive around in my car what inspires you um curiosity i mean like like i think i think what inspires me well 
I immediately think of work, like what inspires my work. And I would I honestly, I'd say pe witnessing people connect with other people is really inspiring and kind of observing how they do that. So that's which is like why I like comedy and film and TV is kind of witnessing people do something new or take a new approach to something and it really connecting with something deep within yourself. That is really inspiring to me. Something that is new. I also love learning. So if I learn about something that I didn't know about before or just kind of blows my mind that it happened on this planet, I find it really inspiring. And maybe I don't directly take that inspiration and put it, put it into something that I do, but it's still inspiring. Like there's a documentary called Searching for Sugarman. And it's about this, you know, uh, artist from the seventies, maybe late sixties. I haven't watched it in ages, so I'm butchering the setup, but basically he, was around kind of during Dylan and Nick Drake and all these kind of groovy singer songwriters made a couple tapes. Didn't have nothing that really happened. Now he like lives in the Midwest with his family, but the tapes made their way to South Africa. And if you ask people in South Africa who the greatest artists of all time are, it's like the Beatles and Rodriguez. And it's like, he didn't know. So the documentary is about him not knowing that this has happened. And, a group of people finding him and being like, you need to come to South Africa because they, they all think you're dead. And I just like remember seeing that. And then this is kind of maybe why I, I resent technology or social media a little bit. Like a lot of the mystery is gone, but we get to engage with a lot more of our curiosity. So it is a bit of a give, give and take where I can hop on and learn about how Ava Gardner and um, Elizabeth Taylor might've had an affair and I can go through, you know, Reddit threads and, things like that, you know, like where I'm like, oh, I get to be investigative. But I think the journey to find that information is gone a, is a little easier where I, where I was like, I'm really inspired when somebody tells me something I didn't know before that really is inspiring to me. Or I see a comedian that gives a perspective on something maybe I do every day that I've never considered maybe other people did um, that kind of recognition in, in work. Um, so it's a kind of a gray area answer, or like a blurry answer. But really, I just think it's um, surprising in new ways to to tell stories or connect with people is always going to be the thing that really really inspires me fuck yeah same it's totally yeah. the same thing like i doing this show has made me realize that a dream that i thought i couldn't get to is actually a thing that i could possibly do like mm -hmm. so i when i was a kid i wanted to be an actor so bad it was the only thing i ever mm -hmm. wanted um mm -hmm. And I wasn't because I wanted, again, to be famous. I didn't really like people looking at me. It was just, I like playing characters. And I like, yeah. I, like that's why I love D&D. &D and, and like, yeah. Oh, but I did a play when I was in like fourth year. I, fourth year doesn't mean anything. Uh, like 16. And yeah, sure. I was assigned a role in this play, which made me feel like I was a bad actor. And that killed the dream for me. It was that. Like, yeah. And so I, because there was a person in the play who was like given a good role, like a role that I think I would have been really good at. And they did really well. And obviously it was like, and it wasn't a sense of jealousy because I didn't give it a shit, but I was like, I would have done better. Like I would have done better yeah. if I was in that role. And he would have done better if he was in this role. Um, But doing this show, and connecting mm. with people and people going no you should you should do it like you should be an actor mm -hmm. um but i i don't even know how where i would even begin but the fact that the fire is still there that i can look into yep. myself and be like oh it's still there i still want to pretend to be someone else for yeah. <laughs> the shoot is uh, is it deeply inspiring to me and just i think the thing that inspires me is belief and encouragement that people are like Yep. you can just fucking do it permission there you go there's the mm -hmm. there's the word i was looking for so permission yeah. it is it is weird that we seek permission i had a conversation yesterday about how some of the things i'm doing right now i don't really like and i kind of feel like i've been put into a social role to do whereas i'm an actor i'm like you where i resonate with what you're saying very heavily where i'm an actor but i've been pushed into other directions because they were safer or might help me get to acting in a different way but I might end up just doing something I don't want to do. And every time 
I really go back to it. It's always like what's really inspiring to me is like performance or I think about like what my favorite parts of directing or acting is and it's always talking about characters and why they do the things they do and then inhibiting and like are inhabiting those people and their psyche and and I don't know I just think it's it's really 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 inspiring. Did you ever have an epiphany? If so, what was it about? Oof. I've got a whole document here. Let's see. Do you? Yeah, I have a lessons document on my desktop. Um Oh man, we have our choice today. <laughs> an epiphany, an epiphany. Well, yeah, it depends. Like, um, like I even saw. Okay, so like the most recent ones are a lot about stoicism. Like I've been really into the classics recently, so I've been reading a lot of like Marcus Aurelius and Seneca. Um, Epicurism is really interesting to me. Like these kind of meditations on life are really interesting to me, and, and just the pure basics. But epiphanies, and is by your definition is an epiphany something you have to have or is it something you connect to it's up to you i don't have a definition of epiphany I, like i don't like having a box for these questions so it's however what whatever way people interpret them mm. uh because it all th there is enjoyment in the answer to of an the process of answering so whatever brings yeah you, whatever marie kondo <laughs> sparks <laughs> something an epiphany an epiphany an epiphany also if if it isn't too personal can i also see your 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 lessons document at some point oh sure i mean i can i mean i you can include or not include these i can tell you a couple of them but i'm trying to think so the first one is is a lesson that's about like burning out friendships by going too hard too quickly so like when you meet somebody that you're like oh my god we really connect and you kind of fall into that trap of like yeah, and we're gonna like hang out all the time, and it's I'm like, I can't wait to be friends with this person, and I and I told them about this trauma and this trauma, and I, and then it's just like awkward after that because you're like, where do we go from here? Like you kind of blow your load a little bit. Um, that's that that's like the, just the first one on there. So it can go from like something like that, which is like pretty, you know, um, like is pretty basic, right? Uh, but then there's like I have a quote here from Susan Sontag where she says like, I vulgarize my feelings by speaking of them too readily to others, where she basically is saying like, by giving and showing so much of myself, I maybe take away the value of them, which doesn't mean you need to be, you know, um, shut off or anything like that. But she's basically kind of saying the same thing as the first lesson, which is like, when you go too hard too quickly, you vulgarize like your experiences or like like you you aren't giving them the, the weighted importance and i've talked to my friend eric about this a lot where i remember when this happened with a girl that i was friends with and i'm still friends with but i was like super excited about like i was like oh my god i'm very uh like deeply connecting with people it doesn't happen all the time i don't think for anybody like you know really deeply and you, you get really excited where you're like oh my god like I, this person sees the world through the same lens and when I when I was kind of let down, I called him and I was like, has this ever happened to you? And he was like, yeah. So like I kind of have a like strategic approach to it now where if I really feel like there's somebody that I really connect with, I make sure to pump the brakes. I make sure to kind of ease into it slowly so our friendship can mature and grow instead of be like front loaded with a bunch of stuff. Um, so those are good ones. But I an epiphany. I mean, a huge one this year. So I did a project last year that was about my dad and I interviewed a bunch of people about him and I never would have thought to do it, but I was writing a project. So I did. And I interviewed his Chinese medicine doctor who was the person he went to for acupuncture and was the only person he ever talked to about dying. And I got to learn what my dad thought of dying before he died and his perspective and what that looks like to be dying. And one of the things he talked about that really shook me to my core and, and changed a lot of my worldview and also the way I value things and value people and also the experience of being alive. Like I'm constantly thinking about not mortality in a scary way, but just in a thrilling way of how extraordinary and extraordinary being like out of the ordinary it is that we are here and how silly it can be that we take things so seriously even though it's okay to take things seriously absolutely i take things very seriously but at the end of the day you can really if you can really connect to the idea that like you leave with nothing like it really is you leave um 
and who knows what happens after it is super super it's a very like buddhist thing too um stoicism buddhism there's a lot of overlap but that's been really nice but so my dad basically one of the things he said before dying was that he finally understood and that he wished that he felt more and not because he was a closed off guy he was incredibly warm very loving very uh, an, an amazing person and what he meant was you know it didn't mean that he was in love with someone else and he wished he told them or anything like that he was just like i now know at the end of my life i can handle any emotion if i had gone through divorce i could have handled that if i had lost somebody close to me i could have could have handled that but I like like him looking back on his experience. He's like, I've up until this point, I I could handle anything that has come my way. What you can't handle is the cancer that invades your body or the car that hits you when you cross the street. But you can handle the things that come your way emotionally. And he was just like, I wish I got to feel more because now I don't get to play anymore. And now that I know that this is the truth, I don't get to play. And that kills me because now that I know that you leave with nothing except for your experiences, and when you're dying. You really only have the things that have happened to you to kind of keep you company. He's like, I wish I just threw wrenches more. Just, you know, told people how I felt, uh, which is a very, you know, kind of people say that at the end of their lives. But I love the way he articulated it with, I could survive any emotion. So why wouldn't I go and try to do everything? Why would I be safe all the time? Being safe is great. Uh, and it's comfortable because I also believe that every like an absolute truth in the world is that every decision we make is based on comfort, whether it's comfort now, or you're deciding to be uncomfortable now for the investment of comfort in the future. Right. And I'm just like, Whoa, I don't know that talking to somebody about <laughs> your dad thought about dying and hearing that, especially as somebody who really likes control and isn't super emotional, isn't very, um, like I'm very logical. It, it's all a product of losing a parent young where you're like, oh shit, I need to like be in control. Set me free in a way that I had never known to be possible. So I think that would be like the, in the last year, the biggest epiphany for me. What emotion has taught you the most? Hmm. Again, not a super emotional person. I'm like, <laughs> let me think. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's emotions, but I will say that my gut feeling has probably taught me the most i think i've been learning a lot recently about bodies and how our bodies are much older than our brains because modern consciousness is only about two hundred thousand years old but our bodies have been around for millions of years right so anytime you have that feeling that gut feeling that something isn't right or the contract you're about to sign might be a sham you go through with it anyway because your brain goes but it could open this door and that door and this other door behind that door but once it dissolves into nothingness because it was never destined to be successful, you go, well, we always knew, duh. You know what I mean? Or like even being gay, I'm like, when I finally admitted it to myself, it was like my subconscious has been whispering to me forever and was like, yeah, duh. You know what I mean? Like your body is telling you constantly your own truths, uh, which is like the most LA fucking sentence ever. But like, but you know what I mean? Like, it's terrible. It's terrible. But it really is like I, I've one of my biggest, like personal projects in the last year has been just really trying to clock how I feel about certain things and really listening to it and not letting my brain because I'm logic. I'm constantly, even emotionally, when I look at people, and what interests me about people is they, the way they react and observing the way they react, it's not how it makes me feel, not how I get pulled into it. It's just the the fascination of, of behavior right and so i would say that feeling i don't know what it's called uh beyond your gut reaction is the the most informative thing for me or laughter laughter too what is a feeling or experience you've had which doesn't have a word that you wish did it's so funny because i just texted my friend because you said you made up a word Prasora. Fuck, now I remembered it. And now I'm like, I can't use it. But my friend, uh, Charlotte, who's uh, a fen another phenomenal person, you'd have so much fun talking to her. She, we were talking about hooking up with people and how we realized that men weren't for us. 
And it was like when you would have sex with men and you kind of be staring at the ceiling and you like don't really feel anything. Or you're just kind of like, or you're, you're so, you're so in your own head about the experience of like, whoa, this is just like two people's bodies. Like, you know what I mean? Like you're not in it with somebody. You're just kind of like, it feels like high-fiving somebody over and over again. Um, and so we, we were talking about this. We're like, we don't have a word for it. Like, why aren't we Italian? Italians have words for everything. So we like made up an Italian word called presora, which is just that feeling of like, if we were to ask like, hey, how'd it go last night? Oh, I hooked up with them. How was it? Yeah, presora. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you, you know that you're like kind of disconnected. Um, fuck, what was your like actual question? A feeling or experience you've had, which doesn't have a word that you wish did. I think it's that moment. God, in other, English language is beautiful, but it's also incredibly limited. Like I'm South American. So my mom would probably have a word for this or like some kind of turn of phrase, like culturally rooted. Um, but for me, a really important feeling is the saddest, it's kind of what you were talking about, but like those really rare moments where you just feel at peace. There is like, for whatever reason you've aligned correctly and, and you become more present and more aware of like, oh, the weather's really nice today. And this song is just hitting really differently. And I'm not worried about the things I'm nor- normally worried about. And it's a fleeting moment, but it's just this click in present moment where maybe you're sitting with a friend, uh, having a really brilliant dinner and you're having a really fun, like sometimes when I'm with my group of friends and we're all laughing and, and I can kind of take a back seat and just watch them do bits or whatever, there's a feeling of like community or, or closeness or connection uh, that also has to do with that specific moment in time, that place that you're at, the food that you're eating, the music you're hearing, the ambiance, the other people, the energy they bring. Like there's just an alignment um, that is very divine. Or, like feels very divine. Um, not, and I'm, I didn't grow up religious by any means, but this idea of divinity or something being divine has been really interesting to me. And and, and I don't have a word for what that is, but you know it. Like, you know, it's like that, something clicks and you're like, oh, this is perfect. This is a perfect moment. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I would even call that. It's almost like holistic, like a holistic appreciation. Like everything, yeah. everything just works just a little bit better than it usually does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're not beating yourself up. Like there's something within yourself too, that isn't like immediately critical or it, you know, like you feel good in your skin and your body too, in that moment where you're like, everything is just, serene the question 18 is what makes you smile what makes me smile oh my god so many things like i don't know we're all programmed to kind of like smile on cue right but i think the something that makes me sincerely smile is when you get a good belly laugh like somebody makes you really like it strikes you hard like i all laugh at a lot of things and things make me laugh but when something really hits within yourself and you smile and you laugh that that is a pretty great way to get to a pretty organic laugh or smile because i don't know in la you're kind of cardboard cut out of yourself constantly where you're like i'm fine i'm good i'm happy and you're always smiling um it but like if you, yeah, it, is. <laughs> it is and then you should like i'm like if anybody moves to la if anybody listens to this and wants to move to la move to la for two years leave for six months then come back then it becomes amazing it becomes amazing you start to appreciate all the things that you didn't maybe appreciate before and you become kind of a journalist to the experience because it is a very particular place to live. But even knowing these things of like, yes, you have to kind of be a certain way or you feel you have to be a certain way. Um, even just removing yourself from that and knowing like, okay, I can do that for people if I have to. But behind that cardboard cutout of myself is like a person who knows himself well. Um, and I think, yeah, I think somebody just making me laugh or something yeah, I think that's the that's the the, the big one. It's just something that really makes me sincerely laugh. It's not like babies or something fucking boring. They don't. I don't give a shit. <laughs> What's the best thing that happened to you this week? I love you, Tess. I love you. Um, I would say the best thing that happened. What What's the week? Give me like a parameter for the week. I'm a big seven rules days. person. In, in All right, hold days. on. Because my memory is so bad, I'm going to look at my calendar. Um. I had so many great things happen this week. I think maybe thematically, uh, New York is really fun, but I think the best thing that happened to this week, to me this week was coming home. I kind of a crazy story, but when I was leaving for London, I had to, do, to give up 
an apartment that meant everything to me. I, it, again, it was the first place I've ever felt like was mine and no one could take it away. It just felt really safe. And, um, and I saw myself living there for a long time, but this opportunity to go to London and kind of change my COVID situation came up and I was like, I it would be a fool not to say yes in accordance to my dad's kind of outlook on the world, right? Like go live, go see things. Um, so I gave up my apartment and it was really hard. And I got back two weeks ago, maybe, signed a lease on another house and I had to reach out to my old landlord um, for a recommendation. And she wrote back to me and was like, hey, Nina, absolutely, of course I'll give you a recommendation. By the way, no one ever filled your apartment. If you wanna move back in, we'd love to have you back and we'll honor your rent. And I was like, for real, like, are you kidding? So I moved back in. So the apartment I'm in is the same apartment I was in when I left, but I redid everything. I was like, if I'm coming back, I'm gonna do different colors, not the same artwork. I'm gonna do different orientations. I'm gonna do all these different things to make it feel new. And it was, just, I, after traveling for seven months and being such a creature of like control and wanting my space, like I really value my space. I think the best part of this week was coming back after work because it's just been go, 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 go and being home for the first time and sitting because it's it's like elevated and has, has um, windows all around. So it gets great light. It gets really warm, like that kind of car seat warm feeling. And so I got back from New York and I just like walked into my apartment and the best part of my week was just the relief of like, I have my food and I have my routines and I have my clean towels and I have, you know what I mean? And I am like, I love the, um, the ritual of unpacking things. So when I come home, like I loved unpacking, I put on a podcast, no one could touch me. Like that is again, one of those perfect moments where I'm like, no one can touch me right now. I've got a good podcast on, I've got, you know, things being put back into their order ceremoniously where I'm like, we are restoring order. And I got to be in my place and my really, my like, well, this is my home. I like love it so much. So I think that would be the best part of my week. I was listening to Poog, which is Kate Berlant and Jacqueline Novak. They're these two comedians that are really big out here, but they basically are kind of, they are half parodying, but also indulging in their interests in the wellness world where they're kind of, it's kind of tongue in cheek. Like they talk about skincare products, but they're also like, victims of consumerism like major major victims so and they're two of my favorite comedians i think they are both really brilliant and kate is pretty influenced by jacqueline because i think jacqueline is a class above her um and jacqueline novak's one one woman show is is another thing that i would say like if i could encourage people to go see something really that was re remarkable to me and really filled me up and inspired me in ways that like I imagine Fleabag did when people first saw it uh, in Edinburgh, like it's something like that. And so they're just really funny, really light, very, uh, you just, they're lovely. Like they really make me laugh, which I think is, I don't know why it's harder these days, but it's just like to find things that really surprise me or don't feel recycled or constantly in the, like Twitter vernacular or Instagram, uh, it's just rare and so they're they're just so unique to themselves that i just was like oh my god there's a new episode i'm gonna put this on and like just be in bliss for like three hours and go to sleep it's perfect mm, fuck yeah that's so yeah. good uh question 20 would you describe yourself as cute and cuddly <laughs> very yeah 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 i think i'm well i'm incredibly cuddly like i that is like, I mean, the best part of sleeping with men was cuddling with them after, you know what I mean? Like it was just, <laughs> it was just like the best, the best thing ever. So I would say I'm very, uh, once I like really get to know somebody, I'm a very like affectionate, touchy person. Um, but when it actually comes to like actual, like not intimacy, just like sex, but like you become, you go from being like a friend in a group setting to like a friend in like a personal setting, I can get a little tighter where I'm like, and it's conditioning from being in groups of girls growing up and being gay and being like you guys all like hang out and touch but like it feels weird for me to do that i don't want you guys to think i'm gay because i'm not you know what i mean um <laughs> but it is like it's like very rooted so i i get kind of can get a little weird but no i'm very one i'm very very cute and very 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 cuddly so i mean that's oh, a great yeah. answer that's a great question thank you 
uh that question came from my realization that like for the first time in my life when i started hormones i felt i felt cute i'd never felt yeah. cute before and i was like and i became very physically affectionate i became I, like i started to yeah. ache and need hugs which yep. i never needed before yeah and uh so that question came from that and i'm cute and cuddly as fuck it's, it's fuck yeah yeah um 20 uh, question 21 tell me about something you learned recently that amused you and i this is the this is a question that i answer every week as well i i i i okay something i learned i you know i do this to my friends all the time where i'll i'll if we hang out i'll be like you can only come over if you bring something that you've learned then you have to talk about it like i'm like i'm i'm a nightmare <laughs> uh i give my friends homework but something i've learned recently see, this is where my memory fails me can you tell me yours first and then it might absolutely uh i learned earlier on today and it's a it's a book that i i'm going to buy there's this book called uh one second i wrote it down uh through the eyes of the expert or okay. it's also called on looking a yeah. walker's guide to the art of observation mm -hmm. which is just the coolest fucking concept for a book ever so the concept is that basically this guy takes uh or i think it's actually a woman that wrote this book uh not 100 percent sure though uh because uh, alexandra horowitz yeah so this woman takes a bunch of experts down the same street 11 experts and it's like describe the street talk about the street and she takes like you know uh <laughs> marine biologists and sticks architects and all of these different people and it's like what does this street mean to you the concept of that did things to my brain where I, it, it amused me because i use amusement in the sense of like not just haha brilliant i use it in the sense no. of like genuine inspiration and amusement yeah. in the richer uh older sense yeah. captivating and, yeah, and so it, it really, really captivated me. It's difficult to get, but um, I'm gonna see if I can get a copy of it because I have to I have to read it. Yeah, that's a the, 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 there's a very Buddhist principle that's very similar. Like when you're training, well, I guess when you're training to become a monk, they make you do the same thing where they make you walk the same path for I think 15 days, and it's a very kind of barren path, but you have to be able to pick something else up that's different than the day before. And I love that kind of stuff where it's like intense presence i think it's it's very hard to do but it's very cool um something i learned about oh this is something that i was just like this is fucking crazy but jfk the president who was tragically assassinated um apparently i just don't know how this is true but apparently after his assassination someone stole his brain and it's still missing and that to me is like shocking <laughs> That the president of the United States, after an assassination, one of the most historical moments in our, at least recent history, his literal brain was stolen and they never recovered it. And I'm like, how do we not talk about this all the time? What? Yeah. And there, people don't know about this either. Watch someone like in the comments be like, this literally didn't happen. You are following a QAnon thread or something <laughs> toxic. But no, I, I uh, learned about this and God, I, I, pretty sure it's true this is like something that like has been around for a long time but yeah his brain's missing like That's pieces of his brain yeah cool <laughs> the fact that someone just like pocketed jfk's brain was like i don't know what i'll do with this but i will gonna take it <laughs> like <laughs> i think it's just extraordinary extraordinary again an interesting choice i think one of my friends like uh has a saying that i've adopted as like a tenant of my life is like just make the interesting choice like whatever it is just make the interesting choice and i'm like Whoever stole JFK's brain made a very interesting choice. <laughs> well, I like to think maybe they put like googly eyes and a cigar on it, yeah. and, like, mounted it or something, or pickled it, and I just absolutely think, yeah. humiliated him. Yeah, <laughs> just absolutely yeah. dogging on the president. Fuck, yeah. he got shot. Yeah, um, I'm gonna dunk on you for <laughs> yeah, post mortem or post yeah post mortem, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like cool. After that, yeah, uh, yeah. Question twenty three. Because I'm mixing things up. If you were on a starship, what position would you hold? I would be, I would be like the operator or overseer, or I would be like community events where I would like organize people's birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. Why? I don't know. I don't want to like be responsible for steering the ship. I'm like, 
I don't want to do like the technical side of things, but I'm like an ideas person. So I'd rather be like, okay, like, let's go check out that planet. And they'd be like, why? And I'd be like, it seems like it could be fun. Like that's like, <laughs> I want to be, again, I want to be, because if we're in space, there's a lot of existentialism going on. So I want to be like the relief uh, for that existentialism. I think that would be where I would, honestly, maybe it wouldn't even be my biggest skill set, but it would be the thing I would want to offer. Or I'm like, I can, I can lead, I can help you guys. Like if, if we really need a captain, I've got you. I feel confident. Like that's how I feel about directing where I'm like, yeah, 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 for sure. I can pretend to know what I'm doing to make you feel better. But I think I would feel better if I was kind of amusing people and trying to alleviate their existentialism up in space. Do you think there is more good than bad in the world? Yeah, but I think people are scared and confused and we misinterpret it for bad. I think, I think ultimately people by and large want to be beloved and feel comfortable, protected, comfort again. And I think a lot of the harm that is out there or the, I mean, on large scales, right? Like genocide, or if you look at something like Myanmar, um, there's just so much hurt. Or even if you look at the US and um, white nationalism, I, I like see it and I'm like, oh man, these are just people who want to be part of something and just want to be like, of course they are doing insane damage and are being, um, incredibly immoral but i think it really does come from unless unless you fall into like kind of the very 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 rare part of the spectrum that is psychopathic uh but even rarer because psychopathy is also a spectrum the same with sociopathy where not everybody who's a psychopath or a sociopath is a killer we just romanticize those elements because it sells so if you're like even within that spectrum on the end of that spectrum and you just happen to be like a, a purveyor of chaos I do think people are good uh, and I do believe that people just want community and understanding and to feel like they aren't so scared to be in a situation where no one knows what they're doing, um, which is still shocking to me that we've been human beings on this planet for so long and we still have no idea what we're doing. Um, so I do, I do, but I'm also an optimist. Like I'm not a pessimistic person. I can be very realistic about things that happen um but definitely not a pessimist i wouldn't say i'm like a nihilistic optimist <laughs> like, i think nothing matters but like that makes everything really fun um whereas you might have somebody who's an, a nihilistic pessimist uh, or a pessimistic nihilist someone like donald trump maybe who is oh my god i haven't said that name in ages it's like it's refreshing uh, yes it's very nice um where i'm like i think that's someone who's so wounded and so vulnerable that is just keen on seeing the world burn because i think he has a very clear understanding that nothing matters and for him he's so protected that he can just kind of go crazy and that's an example of pessimistic nihilism and i think i think and i have to believe that there's better that there's more good than than bad in the world i i'm not a nihilist i i think that thing i i this idea that nothing matters I think is in itself the thing that matters, so I can't be a nihilist. But, but that's but that's the thing about why I love it is like because nothing matters, everything matters. Like everything matters to me, but is coded in this this belief that like at the end of the day, again, not to repeat it for the ninth time, but like you leave with nothing. You leave with yourself. You matter. You know, um, your relationship with yourself really matters. But but this there's a freedom to like oh nothing matters so everything matters like treat people with kindness make it as comfortable as possible for everybody here because it's miserably uncomfortable to have a body and be on this planet so how can you like help people and that makes that gives you meaning and matters I think too so I agree I agree with you but they're they're the, they're one and the same to me if you could give just one piece of advice what would that be make the interesting choice always. I would say, like, if we're if it's just blanket advice, just for my own amusement, I would say make the interesting choice, <laughs> protect yourself, you know, like be be listen to your body and like live a good life. But like, I love it when people make interesting choices. So if you're gonna take advice and make an interesting choice, and I get to observe and witness it, I will be very happy.